and sharing that. So today we're going to share with you the power of native plants and how you can harness that power right in your own backyard. You will learn why choosing to grow native plants rather than non-native or invasive species is so important, what to avoid growing, how to attract pollinators in your yard, and ways you can get involved. But to begin, I want to explain who I am and who I work for. So I'm Megan Pistoles. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, also known as SLILO PRISM, or you'll hear a lot of us just say SLILO for short, that span the entire state of New York, which you can see from this map here. Creating a network of partnerships is an integrative approach to invasive species management. And the PRISM network stem from the recommendations of the New York State Invasive Species Task Force um, back in 2008 and became fully established in 2013. The network itself is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. So SLILO encompasses the five counties of Oneida, Oswego, Jefferson, Lewis, and St. Lawrence. And SLILO is hosted by the Nature Conservancy, but not all PRISMs are. And we collaborate with our partners like the Cornell Cooperative Extension to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. So I always like to begin my talks with explaining what an invasive species is and what it isn't, because it can get a little confusing. So an invasive species is any plant, animal, or even a microorganism like COVID-19, for example, that causes harm to our environment, our economy, or to um, human health. The term invasive species can be easily confused as there are many non-native species that are not considered to be invasive. For example, apples and many agricultural plants are non-native species that are considered to be beneficial to our culture rather than harmful. There are also species that are considered to be a nuisance that are not invasive like dandelions, for example. You may wonder why some non-natives are so invasive, and that is because when a species is introduced to a new environment, rather than where they originated from, they enter the new area often free from environmental factors that keep their populations in balance, like natural predators or parasites. In addition, invasives often also produce many offsprings or seeds. For example, one adult purple loosestrife plant can produce millions of seeds annually. Because of these characteristics, invasive populations often become widespread. The bottom picture here shows invasive common reader Phragmites filling an entire field with a single shrub existing in the mass. In addition to lacking natural predators, invasive species also have attributes that allow them to thrive in environments that other species may not do so well in, such as poor soil conditions. Pictured on the top right here shows invasive Japanese knotweed growing right out of a hole in concrete. So if invasives are so bad for the environment, then why are they here to begin with? Well, many plants that were now considered to be invasive were once considered desired ornamentals that were often intentionally introduced to our country. For example, pictured here is Japanese honeysuckle, an invasive plant that was often intentionally planted by gardeners to beautify their lawns or even by highway designers to control erosion or stabilize banks. However, over time, the non-natives often misbehave and they escape our gardens and invade into our natural areas where they outcompete our native and desirable plant species and damage entire ecosystems. So one of the biggest ways you can help stop the spread of invasive plants is to simply choose to grow native plants. There is power in planting native plants. Choosing native plants not only reduces the spread of invasive plants, but it also supports our native wildlife. That is because native plants have co-evolved with native wildlife and insects. There are many, many specialized relationships that exist between plants, birds, and pollinators and other wildlife. For example, the monarch butterfly needs native milkweed to rear its young. Without milkweed, monarch lar larvae die. Native birds like the chickadee rely on caterpillars to rear their young, and native plants support ca caterpillars. 
we will go into greater detail about what native plants to grow in your yard to support these specialized relationships a little bit later in Sue's talk. But during this next session, I'm going to showcase a few invasive species that you should keep an eye out for while you're enjoying your yard or just the outdoors in general. I'm going to spend a little extra time on invasive jumping worms compared to the other species I'll cover as your master gardener group had high interest in learning about the worms. So invasive jumping worms. So they're native to Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. There are 16 invasive jumping worm species in North America, five of which are invading forests and three that are most commonly found in the Northeast in our region. So like all earthworms, jumping worms were unintentionally introduced to North America. They're not native to here. Um, they were likely brought here in infested nursery stock. There are some stories that say jumping worms were introduced in 1912 in Washington, DC and plantings of Japanese cherry trees for the cherry tree festival or that jumping worms were fed to the duck-billed platypus in the New York City Bronx Zoo, and that's how they got here. Other stories say that jumping worms were found in peat moss at florist shops in Albany in the 1940s. But while jumping worms are widespread throughout much of the US, they have only recently been documented in northern hardwood forests in New York State. That's because they're in the ground. People aren't really paying attention to what's going on in the ground. Um, I do want to just let you know that in New York, jumping worms are a prohibited species, meaning that it is illegal to knowingly transport or sell jumping worms. There are fines and loss of nursery license and certification penalties for non-compliance, although I haven't heard of them being enforced at this time, but they are in place. Um, so this list that I'm showing you here, along with a list of prohibited plants, can be found on the DEC website. And I've also um, put together a nice follow-up email with uh, links to all sorts of resources that I'll talk about today. And this is also included in that. So, or you can write it down here. So back to the earthworms, or the jumping worms. So often earthworms are considered beneficial to soil health. I remember growing up thinking worm, you know, don't hurt the worms, they're good for the soil. Well, this is true for European earthworms in some places, such as gardens or agricultural fields, but the opposite is true for earthworms in forests. In groomed settings, the soil is plowed often and is used to grow annuals usually and can be fertilized when needed. But in forests, the plants rely on the nutrients that the leaf litter puts into the soil. And unlike groomed gardens, forest plants have evolved under completely different conditions and grow much slower than garden plants. So the jumping worms, they live in the top layer of the soil and they quickly consume the leaf litter so effectively and so fast that the soil becomes very granular and dries out quickly. The loss of the leaf litter and soil erosion makes it hard for native plants to grow and it leads to greatly reduced forest um, regeneration and a loss of biodiversity across trophic levels, including amphibians, birds, beneficial fungi, and the understory plants. Soil conditions such as this often pave the way for unwanted invasive plants as well, like garlic mustard and buckthorn. Plus jumping worms, they contain heavy metals that may harm predators like birds and amphibians and other worm species. So down here on the bottom left, you'll see an example of the bare granular soils caused by a jumping worm infestation. And you can also see on the top right, the lack of biodiversity and growth in an invaded area compared to the lush biodiversity that you see in the uninvaded site here on the bottom right. It just gives you an example of what's lost in the forest when the jumping worms invade. Okay, so just a little bit more about the jumping worms. They are parthenogenic, which means that they can reproduce without a mate. They mature very quickly and they reproduce often. July through September is the best time to identify the adult jumping worms. In the spring and fall, 
you can see the cocoons in the soil. And at other times, an indicator will be soil that appears to have that coffee ground look that I've shown pictures of and you can see here. Um, other identifiers, so earthworm species in general can be difficult to differentiate, but invasive jumping worms and European worms can be distinguished from each other by their behavior and the appearance and location of their clitellum or the band that's near their head. In jumping worms, the clitellum is a milky white to gray color. It forms tight to the body, similar to a corset, and it is located near the head of the worm or the non-flat part of the worm. While the European earthworm has a reddish or a raised reddish colored clitellum located more towards the middle of their body. And the biggest indicator is going to be the difference in their, their behavior when they're approached. So the jumping worms do exactly what their name states. They wiggle around vigorously, similar to a snake when touched. While earthworms are much slower and they kind of stretch their body an inch along nice and slowly. And I do have a video, if it will play for me, showing you what the jumping worm looks like when they're approached. See how it flares around like that, like a snake? An earthworm is not gonna do that. They're just gonna kind of, you know, eh, don't touch me. They're not gonna flare around like that. Okay, so this is a map taken from a filtered search on imapinvasives.org, which is an online invasive species observation database. The map shows three confirmed observations circled in yellow on the map and two unconfirmed reports for jump in the invasive jumping worm in the northern part of our region, in St. Lawrence County, in Colton, and then down in the southern portion of Oneida County. It's very likely that there are more infestations of this invasive worm that just haven't been detected or reported as of now. And since worms are in the soil, it's really easy for them to go unnoticed. And once they invade our forests, they are nearly impossible to eradicate. So what can we do about it? Well, you can help stop the spread of the invasive jumping worms by taking a few simple steps. Don't use them as bait. They don't stay on the hook and remember how I mentioned they are high in heavy metals and the fish don't really like their taste anyway. Um, also, the cocoons, they're visible to the human eye. So whenever possible, buy bare root and rinse off the soil in a bucket that might um, to capture any cocoons that might be on the root whenever you're planting in your yard. And don't buy worms for vermiculture. It's recommended to use red wigglers instead. They're much better for the vermiculture. And you know, it, when you're cleaning up your yard, so in the spring and the fall, you know, and making piles of leaves, you know, debris, things like that from trees, the piles of yard waste make a perfect habitat for jumping worms. So don't dump your yard waste in natural areas. Um, send them to, there's usually a local place to send things like that rather than just dumping them in natural areas. And if you use compost, uh, be sure to buy heat treated to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for three days and be sure that the compost hasn't been sitting around any known infestations. You can reach 104 degrees pretty easily by leaving um, bag compost that you get at the store in the sun for three days if you really want to be sure there's nothing in it. And if you can, it's best to make your own compost and it helps reduce your, your food waste too. So, um, And then another thing would be to check for signs. So you can look for the granular soil um, you can look for the worms that have that snake-like movement or the clitellum um, in the area that I mentioned. Um, you can just poke them if you see them and see if they wiggle around like that. Um, another thing that you can do is use a mustard pour to draw the worms to the surface. So do, to do this is pretty easy. Just mix a gallon of water with one third cup of ground yellow mustard seed and pour the solution into the soil slowly. And if you do find jumping worms, please report. It's best to report it to uh, the IMAP invasive database I mentioned earlier. But if you can't do that, please do just take photos, note the location and contact your local Cornell Cooperative Extension. 
Um, the spotted lanternfly is the next species I'm going to talk about. It is an invasive plant hopper native to Asia. It was first introduced in the US and Pennsylvania back in 2014. that my daughter's home. Um, it was introduced on a shipment of landscape rocks and has since spread to the surrounding states, states including New York. Just this past year, live infestations of spotted lanternfly were confirmed in New York City and surrounding areas in Ithaca. So this invasive forest and agricultural pest causes immense damage to economies and ecosystems and invades with over 70 different host plants, including grapevines, hops, apples, and other fruit tree species. SLF will cost millions in economic losses and has the potential to seriously alter our natural ecosystems. So SLF is mainly being spread by people. They lay their eggs on nearly any flat surface and can easily hitchhike on vehicles and outdoor equipment. Uh, during the fall and winter months, you can check uh, tree bark. Uh, they love tree of heaven. So if you um, learn how to identify that and you see tree of heaven, check it out um, for, for spotted lanternfly egg masses or the adults in the springtime. Another place they like to lay their eggs is on tires, as you can see from this picture here. Um, you can check your backyard for these egg masses or uh, if you go visit like a vineyard or something like that, or an orchard, just, just be on the lookout for the, for the masses. So the masses can appear to be brown and raised, as you can see from the picture here, um, or they secrete this um, kind of white grayish waxy stuff over on, on top of their egg masses to kind of make it stick to the surface that they're on. And that has more of a waxy appearance. So they can look like either of these uh, examples here. Um, the nymphs are black with white spots and eventually turn red, as you can see from the middle here. And then they turn red right before they become this beautiful winged adult. So the, the wings are quite decorative and very brightly colored. So if you see uh, adults or egg masses, uh, what you're to do is take photos, note your location, and report it to this email here, spotted lanternfly at agriculturenny.gov. The next species I wanted to tell you about is porcelainberry. It's an invasive woody vine that strangles out trees and other vegetation that it grows on. It is in the grape family, so it le its leaves can look quite similar to native grape. And as you can see, porcelain berry leaves can be quite variable and are therefore not the best indicator of the species. The bark has raised lentils and doesn't peel like native grapevines do. And mature woody stems have a white pith. The berries are purplish blue and have a porcelain sheen, hence their name. The berries are the best indicator that, that you've encountered porcelain berry and they fruit in our region in mid to late September. Uh, porcelain berry has been confirmed in Potsdam and in Ogdensburg. Both sightings were found in yards and had appeared to have been deliberately planted as an ornamental. Do not buy and plant the species in your yard. And then the last species I'm going to cover is wild parsnip. You've likely seen this plant growing along the roadside or along the border of your yard. The fluorescence resembles Queen Anne's lace, but is yellow to pale green in color. Leaves are similar to celery stems and are grooved and contain, uh, the stems are grooved and contain sap that irritates the skin and can cause burns similar to giant hogweed. The plant often grows to waist height and is easy to get into while doing lawn work like mowing or weed whacking. So if you see this plant, do not touch it with bare hands and do not weed whack it or mow it down as the sap will go everywhere and get on your skin and cause a rash. So our next session is going to focus on invasive plants to avoid growing and how to attract pollinators to your yard. But before we move on, I'd like to open the floor to any questions you may have at this time and give Sue a moment to get her screen ready to be shared. 
We do have a couple of questions, Megan, and anyone at this time who has a question they haven't put in the chat, this is a good time for that. Um, somebody was wondering, um, is it true that um, invasive jumping worms taste bad to birds, so they, they prefer not to eat them? Yeah, yes, uh, that's what I've heard. That's what the, what the researchers have shared with us, that they seemed in just tests, they seem to just kind of spit it out. They're like, oh, this looks tasty. And they're like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> so, and I don't know if it's because they're high in heavy metals or what it is, um, but there's something about them that they just seem to not like. Um, there's another question here um, about the leaves. So you were advising um, not to dump piles of leaves, say in the you know forest, or you you, meant, uh, you said a natural area. So somebody was wondering. I thought it was important to allow leaves to stay in your yard for certain butterflies and other beneficial insects. Yeah. So. I was saying like, don't bag up all your leaves and then like go dump them somewhere. If you're gonna keep what you got going on in your yard, that's fine. The, so um, Anise Dobson was sharing, she's one of the researchers for Asian, Asian jumping or jumping worm, invasive jumping worm. And she was doing research in New York City and she was noticing that when people were um, piling up the leaf litter, that's where the higher abundance of the jumping worms were. So they were advising, if you're gonna collect your leaf litter, don't take it and then just put it like in the forest or something like that. Like take it to your local composting area. So it's not being spread from the leaf litter into the forest or into natural areas. But if you wanna keep leaf litter in your yard, go for it. I do the same thing. <laughs> So uh, someone was um, asking if they'll be receiving links and emails to report these invasives. And I think yep. the answer to that is definitely yes. So Megan's going to be providing a follow-up email with um, lots of links for, um, for you to use. Everything that we mentioned today will be in the follow-up email, and it will be easy to understand what we're sharing. Um, why are invasive plant species illegal to sell? Well, because we're trying to stop their spread. So the biggest re the biggest thing is just con controlling their spread and preventing them from entering a new area. So that's why there's regulations in place to let people know what species we're trying to not spread around. And how do you eradicate jumping worms? Well, at this time, the best the best thing to do is just prevent their introduction because there is there's still research going on to figure out how to eradicate them. Um, at this time, the best thing to do is uh, follow the steps I shared. And if you think you have the worms, you can use the mustard pour. And as the worms come up, you could collect them in a bucket. It will be um, timely, but at this time, that is the best way to do it. Um, I can share some more resources with some of the research that's going on for control but at this time there isn't an exact method available for me to share. Um, and someone asked, um, how well does washing roots get rid of jumping worm eggs and how many times do we need to wash? Um, currently we're washing three times. And that's what I've heard um, is the recommended, like doing a triple wash um, each time in a separate bucket of water. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're not seeing the cocoons any longer on the roots, then you're fine. And then just capturing them in a bucket of water, not just like taking it and spraying it with a hose so then the cocoons go flying everywhere. <laughs> um, Makes sense. Yeah, like just sticking it in a bucket and just sticking your fingers in it. Um, or if you have potted plants, if you do the mustard pour over the soil, um, and if something comes up, you can pluck out the worms if they're in there live or if you're looking for the cocoons, you could dump the soil into a bag and then rinse the, the roots and then plant where you're wanting to plant. It is gonna be a little bit more of a process and time consuming, but in the long run, it's better to take the extra five to 10 minutes in the beginning when you're doing your plantings than it is to have an infestation that you likely won't be able to eradicate. Okay, and I'm gonna try to mute myself here if I can find, can you mute me please? and let, um, see we have the floor. Okay. Sue, you're up. 
Okay, thanks, Erica. Thanks, Megan. Um, good morning, everybody. I, I think it is still morning. Um, I'm Sue Guise. I'm the horticulture educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Jefferson County. Um, I'm also the master gardener coordinator in the county. I've been at this job for 20 years. And for those of you who don't know where Jefferson County is, it's, um, it's where Watertown is. Um, we're at the eastern end of Lake Ontario, um, up by the Canadian border. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be um, specific to the conditions we have here in Jefferson County. I'm very impressed by all the people um, that signed on, all the different places that you've come from. Um, I loved your plant choices. And just know that beyond what I'm going to talk about, most of you probably have a lot more options uh, than we have up here. I'd also like to give a shout out to the folks in Cattaraugus County. Um, my mother is from that area and I'm very familiar. I spent a lot of time um, down there as a child and my son actually lives there now. Um, one last announcement for those of you who live in Jefferson County, we're going to be doing a master gardener training in April of 2021. So if anybody's interested in that training, they can contact me directly. So uh, today we're gonna talk about um, different ways to support pollinators in your home landscape. So you all know, um, you all are aware of the issues um, that have been happening for probably the last decade or so, probably more than that. Um, you know, populations of our native pollinators and um, native bees are in decline. Um, and this is throughout the world. It's not just in the United States. And the main causes for this are, are the use of pesticides, um, the fragmentation of habitats, and the degradation of habitats. So we need to encourage pollinators. And to all of you out there, I, I know this is obvious. You probably already know this. But pollinators are what's called a keystone species. A large number of other species depend on them for survival. If you have abundant pollinators in your ecosystem or in your landscape, that is indicative of a healthy landscape. Pollination creates a seed and we need to make that seed to perpetuate the species. In fact, 80% of flowering plants and most native plants need insects for adequate pollination. So without pollinators, we would have none of, none of this. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of information in the press about what happens when the pollinators disappear. And this is a huge problem in China. And these are just some headlines and some pictures I pulled off the internet um, showing what happens when the pollinators disappear and people have to hand pollinate plants. And the pictures show um, uh, apple trees in China and they have to be hand pollinated. Somebody actually has to climb up into the tree and brush each one of those flowers because there just aren't enough pollinators to do the job. And of course, we don't want to end up in that situation. Um, can you imagine how expensive produce would be if we had to do this um, across all species? So, um, you know, when the pollinators, when we, when we do things to um, upset the pollinators and ruin their habitat, um, they start to disappear. As a result, the native plants disappear. Invasive plants move in and birds and animals move out. So basically you kind of end up with, with a dead system, kind of like a, an, a, a sterile system where there's just not much going on. So let's talk about what you can do at home to support pollinators. First of all, don't plant invasives. Um, and, you know, Megan talked about some invasives. Um, she made it very clear about how evil invasives are. Um, you probably already have some invasive species in your yard. 
Um, a big one is Norway maple. This is the maple that has red leaves all year long, sometimes referred to as a crimson king maple. It is not a red maple. A red maple is a native species. Norway species, Norway maple is not native as per the name. And um, basically what happens is these trees have been so overplanted, um, they, they just outcompete our native sugar maple and red maple. Probably all, a lot of you already have these in your yard. I'm not suggesting that you, you cut them down, but um, do not perpetuate them. And a lot of these uh, plants that I want to talk about are regulated now. You can no longer buy them. But this used to be a common plant that was sold in nurseries. And it can re be replaced with red or sugar maple or red oak. The reason Norway maple was promoted in the first place is it's very tolerant of urban conditions. Sugar maple, not, not good in urban environments. Um, but red maple and red oak will do well. Um, and besides being invasive, Norway maple is just a bad species. It develops a lot of root issues, a lot of trunk issues. So we don't, we don't recommend it at all. We haven't, you know, even prior to, to the regulations that have gone in. Winter creeper is a euonymus um, that's invasive, can be replaced with all the various types of ferns that are native to New York State. Japanese barberry is another one that has been very popular over the past 30 years. Um, everybody likes those, those reddish leaves and the cascading effect of the plant, um, very invasive. They are selling sterile varieties now, probably more expensive just for that reason, but there are a lot of good natives like chokeberry and nine bark that, um, that can be used as substitutes for Japanese barberry. Another one is burning bush, euonymus. A lot of people love this because of that fiery red color in the fall. Um, dogwood and choke cherry are going to give you the same results. Some other ones um, that are problematic, Bradford pear. Everybody loves these trees because in the spring they, they put out a profuse amount of white blooms. Um, but not only are they invasive, but when they bloom, they smell horribly. Um, in some places, in some urban areas, I remember an example in Chicago where these are overplanted in the city center. And when they are in flower, people can't even go outside. The smell is so horrible. Not to mention the fact that these trees um, have poor um, branch structure and, and, and just break easily and lead to a lot of problems. So no bread for pears, native crab, native uh, crab apples, service berry are good substitutes. Russian and autumn olive can be substituted with staghorn sumac and hazelnut. And there's probably a lot of you um, that are throwing out red flags at my mention of staghorn sumac. A lot of people are afraid of this native species um, because it does sucker profusely. Um, but it is a very good wildlife species, fiery red fall color. And if you're planting it in an area where you're going to be mowing, if you're going to be mowing around this plant, you don't have to worry about the, the sucker habit. Um, the Asian honeysuckles, they are everywhere. Um, if you have any marginal areas on your property, a hedgerow, a wooded area, um, you probably have these Asian honeysuckles, which can be replaced with dogwood. Um, Bishop's weed, Sure, a lot of you know this guy. You probably bought it or maybe you had it on your property and it's a nice ground cover and maybe when you bought it, it looked like the picture. But what happens is that it reverts back to its uh, native habit and it, the leaves become all green and it is super invasive. Anybody who has had this knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it invades the soil and the, the roots are like spaghetti. You cannot get rid of it. So don't even go near that one. Um, Golden Alexanders and Canada anemone are good replacements. So stay away from the natives and favor native plants in your garden or landscape. 
And the reason why, you know, probably a lot of you already know this, but native plants are just better adapted to our soil and climate conditions. Um, they have fewer insect and disease problems and they tend to be well behaved. They, they don't usually become invasive. And if you have a healthy population of native plants, this is going to help prevent native species or invasive species from invading an area. And I think Megan pointed this out in her presentation also. Our native plants, um, birds and insects all evolved together. Um, over millions of years of evolution, um, birds and insects know how to use our native plants. When we plant native species, we're putting something out in the, in, in the environment that our native insects and birds can recognize and use for food and shelter. Non-native plants, they just provide less support to native pollinators. Native plants are going to end up attracting native insects, which are going to attract native birds. And there's a reason for this. 90% of all songbirds raise their young on caterpillars that feed on native plants. So if you like to have the birds, um, if you have the native plants, that is going to attract the birds. Birds that are nesting like to feed their young a nice juicy piece of protein. They don't feed their young berries or seeds. They feed them caterpillars and worms because they're just more beneficial. Um, and that's what they look for are, are mainly caterpillars. So if you have the native plants that are attracting the caterpillars, you will have a healthy bird population also. Caterpillars basically are eating machines and they are very specific as per what they will feed on. Um, adult butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on what are called food plants, plants that the larva will feed on once they hatch. And a lot of the native species that I'm gonna be talking about are food plants for butterflies and moths. Adult moths and butterflies, they may get some nectar, they drink water, but in general, they will just go to any source of water or nectar they can find. It's the caterpillars that need specific plants. Okay, let's see, I already just discussed that source of protein. And so bottom line, if you have those native food plants out there, you're gonna have the caterpillars, which will translate into adult butterflies and moths, which will attract the songbirds. So what is native? How do you find out if something is native? Well, there is a kind of a rule of thumb, plants that were here before colonization are considered native. And we draw that line at about 1600 because that's when you know, the Europeans really started making an impact on the environment. Um, how do you find out if something is native? There are a lot of sources. Um, native Plants of New York by uh, ESF Professor Don Leopold is a good one. <clears throat> Audubon Field Guides will, will tell you what's native. And if you get online, the New York Floor Atlas is a good source of, um, of telling you what is native and what's not. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of debate about nativity. Um, you know, we kind of draw this artificial line at the year 1600, but prior to that, Native Americans had an impact on the environment. They moved plants around. They brought species from South America, corn, squash, potatoes, and they slowly made their way north over thousands of years. Um, so Native Americans did have an impact on the environment. And you know, how far back do you wanna go with this? Um, if you go back far enough, millions of years ago when all the continents were connected as one mass, then, then everything is native. 
So there's a lot of debate about this. There are no black and white rules. And this is an interesting book. It's called Planting in a Post-Wild World. And what this book suggests is that we really don't have a wild native environment anymore. We have so changed the environment from what it was prior to 1600 that this native ecosystem doesn't really exist anymore. Um, you've got to remember that all of most of New York State was cleared in the 1800s for farmland. So what we have here is, is uh, our plants and forests that have regrown since that point. And they're very different from those original forests that were here prior to 1600. So it's an interesting concept. And if you're, if you have, if you are interested in that, um, this is a good book to take a look at. And the bottom line is, is that many non-native species and plants that we consider less than desirable also support pollinators. Um, many of those weeds that are introduced um, and ornamentals that are that are used as and ornamentals are used as food plants. Um, an example would be dandelions. They're not native, um, but go out. Um, in your lawn when those dandelions are out and you will just see lots of pollinators um, working those flowers. Basically anything with a flower that has nectar or pollen will support adult pollinators. And that's going to depend on, you know, what type of tongue the pollinators have, what type of mouth parts they have. Um, that's dependent on whether they can reach in there and get that nectar reward or not. But um, in general, anything that flowers is probably good as long as it's not invasive. So I don't want people to get hung up on making sure everything is native. You probably have things in your landscape that are not native. Don't rip them out, um, but just try to in the future encourage native species. Be more concerned about native plants and think about the whole idea of, you know, do we even have a native environment anymore? If you live in a town or a village, that area is completely different than it was 300, 400 years ago. Um, I live out in the country. The location that I live on um, was farmland and pasture, not the uh, uh, Eastern forest that was originally here. Another thing to keep in mind is diversity. Uh, um, plant species from different plant families. Um, not only will this attract more pollinators, but if you limit yourself to certain families or you have a lot of species, say from the rose family, if there is an insect issue or especially a disease issue that moves into the area that prefers those rose family species, you're going to have some problems in your landscape. So diversify, um, plant different types of plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, vines, annuals. Go for different flower shapes. Like I mentioned earlier, different insects are able to um, work different flower shapes depending, de dependent upon their mouth parts. And so if you have different flower shapes, you're going to attract more insects different flower colors, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Different insects are attracted. Let's jump into um, some of the, the more attractive butterfly species and moth species that people like to see, and the plants that you need in the garden to attract them. So, um, <clears throat> Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. The food plants that it requires are cherry and ash. And I'm willing to bet that most of you probably have both of these species in your neighborhood. A lot of this stuff is already exists, is, is very, very common. The black swallowtail, the food plants the larva prefer are anything in the carrot family. So dill, fennel, parsley, uh, Queen Anne's lace. All of these are not native. The clouded sulfur prefers legumes like alfalfa, clover, and vetch. Slide my screen over there so I can see better. 
the spring azur, dogwood and viburnum. A silvery blue, again, likes legumes, vetch, clover. The morning cloak, which is one of the first uh, butterflies that's out in the spring, prefers all of these native species, willow, poplar, elm, and hackberry. And I'm willing to bet that all of you have, have some of these species on your property. The red admiral likes nettles. Now, how annoying are nettles, especially if you get into stinging nettles, which are native, um, but you know, it's a species that we, we might tend to want to get rid of, but it is a species that attracts red admiral, admiral butterflies. The painted lady is attracted to two very annoying species, burdock, which is not native, and thistles. Um, there are a lot of thistles that are not native, but there are several um, that are native to our area, including the, the tall thistle and the swamp and, and pasture thistles. The silvery checker spot prefers anything in the sunflower family. So anything that has that composite type flower shape to it. The Baltimore likes turtle heads. And if you have any, any wet areas in your garden, um, that's where turtle heads like to grow and that will attract Baltimore butterflies. Um, white Admiral butterflies, again, here we come into some of these native tree species, willow, aspen and poplar. Um, not the strongest, best tree species, but they are very attractive to a lot of these uh, native um, butterfly species as food plants for their larva. And the northern pearly eye prefers grasses. And now we get into some of these large moths. This is the Cecopria moth, the largest moth in the eastern part of the United States. Look at all these common species that attract the Cecopria moth. Um, all of them are native except lilac. Lilac is not native. The polyphemus moth, rose, birch, and willow species. The luna moth, these are so cool and so fun to see. And again, very common native species um, attract these. And then we have the fun hummingbird, clear wing moth, which is attracted to viburnum. So as you can see, if you wanna attract some of these, these larger, very flashy pollinators, you probably already have a lot of these species in your garden and don't dismiss um, some of those species that you might consider annoying because they are um, useful too as, as food plants. Next, I'm gonna talk about um, the, the really powerhouse plant species that um, are going to attract the most pollinators. Now, I, I wanna preface this by saying, this is not the be all and the end all list of plants that are attractive. There are hundreds and thousands of other species that are equally as good. The reason we suggest these species is because they tend to be very easy to grow. And, and this, um, this brochure was kind of put together for beginning gardeners and people who are um, new to the whole concept of native species. We didn't want to give them species that are very difficult to grow. We want people to be successful. So we put together this list. I believe there's 25 species and I'm gonna talk about some of them. Um, this list, um, not only are they easy to grow, but there's some deer resistance in most of these species. And for those of you who are not in Northern New York, um, you're gonna be able to grow these plus more and you probably have already have in mind lots of other species, but uh, this list does tend to be specific to Northern New York. And this was uh, vetted by master gardeners. We put this list together um, interviewed all of our master gardeners here in Jefferson County and said, you know, how, how do you feel about these plants? Are they difficult to grow? What are the problems associated with them? And these were the easiest to take care of. And again, they all have some deer resistance. So <clears throat> 
If you have the plant diversity, you're going to have the pollinator diversity. Deciduous trees that are very good for pollinators. Um, birch is an excellent larval food source. And <clears throat> a lot of you are probably familiar with birch species. Most of them have this exfoliating bark um, that's not only attractive in your landscape, and besides being a food plant for a lot of larvae, it's also a, an area of shelter for beneficial insects, place to lay eggs, a place to pupate, place to hide during bad weather, a place to overwinter. So um, these little uh, curls and, and pieces of bark that you see coming off are actually very beneficial to insects. Hawthorn species. Um, you get the nice white flowers in the spring. Um, not only is it a food plant, but the flowers are going to be attractive uh, to adult pollinators. Service berry, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Cherry species, poplar species. Evergreen trees are also a good plant to have in the garden. Not because they're food plants, but because of their density um, things like red cedar, northern white cedar, pine and spruce. These are very dense plants and they offer good shelter to insects, um, overwintering sites, pupation sites, etc. Some shrubs that are the powerhouse uh, food plant species, dogwood is one. And um, as most of you know, there's a lot of options for this. Um, our native red twig dogwood is pictured. And in the landscape against the snow, um, you, you can't beat the way this looks. Um, chokeberry, aronia, um, not only does this serve as a food plant, um, it also has berries and flowers. And the berries are actually edible by humans. Um, black chokeberry is edible, very desirable. Um, because of that very, very dark berry color that's beneficial to people. Currants and gooseberries, nine bark, which is now available in a lot of uh, cultivars that have uh, reddish or reddish green leaves. And we'll talk about cultivars in a minute. Um, elderberry, raspberry and blackberry, if you have marginal um, areas on your property, you probably already have raspberries or blackberries. Willow species. And for a vine, uh, Virginia creeper. Now this is another one where a lot of red flags are going to go up for people, but Virginia creeper is a, a very important food plant for larva. And if you plant it in a location where it has something to climb on and you are mowing around the base of it, you don't have to worry about it. It is a plant that tends to spread and tends to sucker for profusely, but if it's in a lawn setting, it shouldn't be a problem because you're gonna be mowing it. Um, the perennials and wildflowers, a lot of these are what I would consider powerhouse species um, as larval food plants. And you're all familiar with these. Um, you probably have a lot of these in your garden. Um, the only one that isn't truly native is the purple cone flower. Um, we kept it on our list because it just offers so many benefits, but it's not native to New York. It's, um, it's more of a prairie or a Midwestern species. Meadowsweet, which is our native Spirea, cardinal flower, which tends to grow in wet areas. And if any of you are familiar with cardinal flower, it has like a long tubular shape. So now we're getting into a different flower shape that's going to attract different pollinators that have long tongues that can get that tongue down into the tube and get that nectar reward. Columbine, again, another nectar species for shady areas, Joe Pieweed. Um, and bone set. Again, um, if you have any of these growing on your property, the sound of um, the pollinators in the summer when these are in flower is just audible. All you need to go do is walk by 
and you're going to hear a lot of pollinators working those flowers. And another one um, that um, is a very good pollinator species is goldenrod. Not only is a food plant species, but it's also the flowers are, are just like boneset or joe pie weed. They're very attractive. The sound that you hear is audible. This picture was taken in front of our cooperative extension office, which is right in the middle of Watertown, very urban area. And in the summer, you can go out and you, you get within you know, a few yards of this and you can hear the bees and, and pollinating insects just working this plant. Um, a lot of people don't like goldenrod because they think it contributes to seasonal allergies. It does not. Goldenrod is insect pollinated. Unfortunately, it flowers at the same time as ragweed, which is the evil, the evil one that is wind pollinated. And ragweed is the one that causes seasonal allergies, not goldenrod. Goldenrod gets the blame because it's out there and it's more noticeable. So another thing you can do is um, plant certain families of flowers that are most attractive to pollinators. So plants in the carrot family and plants in the daisy family, they have flower shapes that most pollinators recognize and are attracted to. So in the carrot family, things like parsley, celery, dill, coriander, things that have that humble flower shape, that upside down umbrella shape. So, we, you know, we've got here, we've got dill, we've got cilantro or coriander, and um, this is that humble shape that's very attractive. Same thing goes for anything in the daisy family, um, that composite flower head. So sunflowers, marigolds, zinnias, anything that's got those uh, ray flowers around the outside in that button center of disc flowers. The shape is very attractive to pollinators. So especially with the daisy family, this encompasses a lot of the annuals that we you know, normally plant in pots or in addition to our flower beds, whatnot. So as long as you're planting a lot of annuals, you're probably going to have a lot of daisy family plants in your garden. Now there's some things you should do to use flowers for the most benefit. Um, it's suggested that your garden should have at least 15 different flowering species. Now that may sound like a lot, but in that 15, you need to include those trees um, birch, cherry, they all flower, they, especially birch, they, they flower, they may not be very, um, they may not be very attractive when they do it, you may not notice it, but they all have flowers and a lot of these are a good source of early pollen for pollinators. So 15 different species and if you start thinking about it and adding up you know, you're probably most of us who, who garden are probably above that, but, but don't forget to include those tree, those tree species. Um, plant diversity is going to uh, translate into wildlife diversity. Plan on successional blooming. You need to have food available when the insects are active. And for most insects, the temperature threshold is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when insects get going, they're cold blooded, 50 degrees is when they start to get out there and start moving around. So that basically means you need to have stuff in flower basically end of April. Well, some of you are in more Southern areas, but here in Northern New York, end of April um, into October, some of you can, can get away with longer, with a longer period of time. Um, so have something in bloom, you know, throughout the season to keep those pollinators interested. Plant flowers in groups, insects can see them better. And, you know, for those of you out there who are master gardeners, you know, you've had some landscape training, you know, we would never plant just a single flower. Um, we, we plant things in, in groups because it just looks better. Um, this is something that um, somebody had touched upon earlier when, uh, when we had our little glitch there. Um, when you select uh, plant species, especially native species, 
you should go with what's called the straight species. Um, do not use hybrids. Um, a lot of times when hybrids are bred, um, the pollen may be bred out of them. Um, so the, the insect may recognize the flower. It may go to the flower looking for pollen and not find anything. Um, also, a lot of hybrids are bred to be double flowers. That's a big thing now. Everybody wants these really dense flowers. And even though they may have pollen and nectar in them, they are so dense that the pollinators cannot get to that pollen or nectar. So by going to these um, plants that are kind of um, fake and they're confusing the insects, the insects are wasting a lot of energy even going to these. So stick with the straight species. And at the end, I believe on our list, we're gonna have um, the names of some, some um, nurseries and places you can go to that specialize in species rather than hybrids of native plants. Um, as far as flowers, flower shape goes, um, if you want to attract butterflies, they are most attracted to long tubular flowers and the colors that they see the best are red, orange, and yellow. Moths, as we talked about those, those very large striking moths, moths are out at night. They like night blooming flowers like jimson weed and evening primrose. And if you want to attract bees, uh, actually bees see blue the best. Um, they cannot see red. So if you want to, you know, support that bee population, blue flowers are the best way to go. Consider the habitat that you have in your landscape. Um, in America, we grow lawns and lawns are a monoculture. It's a very sterile culture. Um, we, they don't flower. Um, they, they do store a lot of carbon, I will admit that. But is, as far as diversity, they're kind of like a desert. And as we talked about earlier, we want diversity. Um, diversity is a good thing. So um, a lot of people are shrinking the size of their lawns. They are mowing less. They are letting a lot of areas go back to a more natural state. And that's going to be, to be much better for the environment. Um, do not use pesticides. Um, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you know, you may have a little insect problem, maybe some aphids on some of your plants and you know, you go out there and spray it with the insecticide. Yes, it's going to kill the aphids, but it's always also going to kill beneficial insects. Insecticides are not selective. They just don't kill the aphids and the Japanese beetles. They kill any insect and whatever your insect problem is, contact your local cooperative extension. We can give you um, control methods that are what we call cultural or organic controls that don't involve pesticides. They may not get rid of the problem immediately. They may just tamp it down a little bit, but there are options beyond pesticides. Um, a source of water is good in the environment. Butterflies like puddles. If you've ever noticed after a rainstorm, butterflies will come along and they will, they will work the puddles that are maybe on stones or, or in the grass. And another thing you need to do is provide nesting habitat. Um, things like bare soil for ground nesting bees, um, trees with loose bark like we talked about earlier, and snags or unkept areas provide shelter. And, and what this translates into is you need to have some messy areas. And as Americans, you know, we like to control everything. We like everything to be perfect, but it's better if you have some standing dead trees, as long as they're not in danger of falling on somebody. It, it's good to have some, some messy areas. And a lot of people get nervous when I talk about ground nesting bees. They think, oh my God, why would I want to attract these? I'm not referring to yellow jackets that nest in colonies in the ground. I'm talking about solitary bees 
that lay their eggs singly in individual um, chambers in the ground. These are not colonial bees. Um, they are not going to sting or attack you. Um, and we'll talk about those a little bit in a minute. So that brings me to the less flashy pollinators. Now, whenever anybody talks about pollination, the first thing that pops into people's minds is honeybees and butterflies. And actually, honeybees are good at pollinating. Um, butterflies and moths are really not that great. They are not the workhorses that are out there. The workhorses are our native bees and a lot of other insects. For example, um, honeybees are not native. Um, they, they have become wild, but they're not native to North America. They were brought over here um, for their, for, for honey making um, when colonists came over. Um, our native solitary bees are what I mentioned earlier when I talked about ground nesting bees or potter bees or bees that nest in stems or holes in wood. Um, they don't live in colonies, but they are very important pollinators. And these are some of the pollinators that we're seeing disappear in large numbers. Um, so these are the wood nesting bees, the ground nesting bees. Another thing to think about is bumblebees. Bumblebees are excellent pollinators, better than honeybees. And in a lot of places where um, hives are brought into orchard, orchards for pollinating services, um, in a lot of these cases, um, growers are using bumblebees because they are just more effective. Um, bumblebees have a longer tongue than a honeybee and that allows them to uh, pollinate flowers that have deeper or more complex shapes. Um, bumblebees are generalists. They'll visit a variety of plant species and that includes our native wildflowers and food plants. And bumblebees can um, thermoregulate, which means they can shiver. And as a result, they are out there working the flowers at lower temperatures than most other insects. Um, remember I talked about that 50 degree threshold. Um, bumblebees can operate at much lower temperatures. So in rainy, cold conditions, they're more likely to be out working versus uh, honeybees. And they also do this, uh, this little activity called, or this little uh, thing called buzz pollination. If you've ever watched a bumblebee get inside of a flower um, it will vibrate its whole, whole body and you can hear that. Um, that's called buzz pollination. And that's, they're basically inside the flower shaking that pollen around. And that's gonna be more effective for pollination than insects that don't do that. Um, surprisingly, there are some fly species that are important pollinators. Um, if you just glanced at both of these, you'd say, well, that's a wasp and the one on the right is a bee, but they're not. They're not in that Hymenoptera family. They are in the fly family, the Diptera family. And if you get close enough to look at these guys, if you can get that close, um, they only have one set of wings and that's indicative of a fly species. Um, insects and the bee uh, family, they have two sets of wings. So these are what are called bee mimics. And they are excellent pollinators. They, they go to flowers, a lot of them actually eat pollen, um, as do a lot of beetles. Um, you know, beetles, you know, tend to be kind of boring. Um, but all of these guys will visit flowers, and they will eat that pollen. And as a result, they are providing pollinator services. So the bottom line, um, diversify. Nurture what you have, you know, don't feel you need to wipe every non-native out of your environment, unless it's an invasive species, yes. Then if it is an invasive species, I'd say, you know, go for it, get it out of there. Um, eliminate those invasive species and provide a pollinator friendly habitat. And anything you do to um, in your anything you do in your landscape 
that's beneficial to butterflies is going to end up being beneficial to bees, birds, and um, other pollinating species. Don't use pesticides. Favor native species, but know that they may not be ideal depending on your setting. And here are some resources, um, just some books that you might be interested in. Um, I'll leave this up on the screen and take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Sue. Um, Erica, I don't know if you want me to just take over this part since you um, were having problems with your chat. Um, yeah, there. well, there was, I, I lost um, my whole chat feed a minute ago when I lost a connection. So, um, but I'll, I would, I'll just bring up a couple of the questions that, that came up before then that I remember. Um, somebody was wondering, um, are the, um, are the, uh, we know that there are non-native, for example, in the, the rose um, genus, there are, there are non-native and natives within it, and they're both of use to native pollinators. Um, do, do they, de do pollinator, do native pollinators depend on those um, non-natives? And also, for example, with the, um, do, do native larvae use the, for example, the European current? Somebody was wondering, um, even though it's not a native species within the, the current um, group. Okay, that, that's a good question. And I'm not sure if any research has been done on that, but if you have a, a particular pollinator that prefers plants in the rose family, okay, they're probably going to go to a plant in the rose family that's native to Europe and ones that are native here because the rose family has certain characteristics that they're used to using. So my initial thought is that, you know, these non-native plants that are in these favored families would probably be fine, but that's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And um, that would probably be a good question for this gentleman right here, Douglas Ptolemy, um, and his book, Bringing Nature Home. He could probably answer that question, um, but we'll look into it and see what we can find out. Um, there was a, um, somebody mentioned that there was a bird question, which I actually, I missed the question and I can't see it here, but Nick Hamilton Honey, who's a, a colleague of mine here at CCE offered to answer that question. And do you want to unmute Nick and answer that? Yeah, sure. And I'm sorry you can't see me. Um, I just don't have the bandwidth to, to watch the video and have video. Um, so yeah, songbirds, the question was, are there other um, inverts uh, that birds will eat uh, other than the caterpillars? And yeah, there's several. So, you know, your bluebirds will eat grasshoppers and crickets and beetles um, and even, you know, uh, moths, uh, cardinals, uh, you know, again, beetles and grasshoppers, other leaf hoppers. Um, even stink bugs, sometimes they'll eat snails. Uh, cardinals have a wide variety of, of diet options. Um, chickadees are smaller, uh, so like aphids, some of those white flies. Um, they'll do ants, sometimes they'll eat earwigs. Uh, um, nuthatches, nuthatches will eat uh, you know, any of the tree and shrub insects, they're not as picky. They eat all kinds of, uh, you know, borer insects, um, but also then ants and earwigs and uh, a wide variety of, of invertebrates. So it's not Thank just you. those caterpillars. Thank you, Nick, for that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, somebody was wondering, um, how to uh, entice their bumblebees or uh, carpenter bees, I guess, uh, from um, creating homes in the, in the side of this person's house. Uh, did you wanna say something about, um, about creating um, uh, nesting locations for native pollinators? 
yeah, um, if you're if you're having trouble with carpenter bees, um, I, I'm willing to bet that they're probably drilling into unfinished wood because that that's what they prefer. Um, so an easy fix for that would be to you know put some type of finish on the wood. Um, what Erica, I think it was Erica mentioned is is correct. If you could maybe lure the carpenter bees away from um, from your siding, uh, from your soffits, um, you could put in um, um, bee bee homes. Um, uh, you can buy you can buy um, um, these hanging collections of tubes that are attractive to um, insects that, that like to nest um, in natural cavities. I don't know if carpenter bees would use those or not. That's another good question for an entomologist. Um, somebody was wondering if you have any recommendations for resources on how to distinguish between native and exotic wasps and hornets. There, well, there's probably a lot of information online. The, the publication I use is a, um, I believe it's a Cornell publication, and it's actually for people who do bee and wasp control. Um, you know, it tells you how to control these, but it does have a section on the various um, different species and describes if, if they're native or not. Um, I don't know if that if I have, if I can get if I have that book I'll get it and I'll put it up on the screen. It's either at my office or here at home, so I would have to go take a look and, and get the get you the exact title for that. I wrote it down too, Sue, as a follow up. Okay. And we might. What do you think about this echinacea question? It's been asked a couple times. Is that another follow up, or can you answer that? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, um, are any pollinators or Lepidoptera that rely on Echinacea as a host plant native to New York, even though Echinacea is not native? That I don't know. Um, the adults, the adult pollinators, the adult moths and butterflies will use Echinacea. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good species for the adults. Uh, as far as a food plant, that's another one that I can get that, get you that information. I can see it right over on a shelf. Um, I would have to look into that. All right, follow up. We'll follow yeah, the up. question's a little confusing to me too. I'm not sure if you're asking if echinacea is native or not native. What, or... what, what I think what they're asking is that because echinacea is not native, um, do any native New York pollinators even use it as a food plant? And it's, okay. it's, a, it's a very good question. Okay. Um, I think, uh, are there any other questions from the part of the chat that I don't have access to? Or do you wanna go on to your demonstration, Megan? Um, it might be a good idea just to stay on time. We're probably gonna run about 10 to 15 minutes over, but I think that we would have been on time had we not had technical difficulties. So I think we're okay. Um, hopefully everyone can stay on the line and just um, learn about these opportunities I'm going to share. Um, if there, are, I am gonna save the chat. Um, so, you know, when we end, don't, don't close out right away. Erica, and give me a minute to save the chat and then I'll go back okay. through and, and we can mm -hmm. answer questions um, through email. Okay, hopefully. All right, I gotta share my screen. Okay, you should, should be seeing a web, web page now. Mm -hmm. We see it. Excellent. And hopefully my daughter's not too loud because she is home and she, I can hear her in the background. Okay, so I want to share, I'd like to um, end our discussion with um, just a couple brief live demonstrations of a few community science opportunities that you can all get involved in that support um, pollinators or that help reduce the spread of invasive species. So I mentioned earlier spotted lanternfly. This is one of our priority species that we're trying to strengthen early detection efforts for. 
we're trying to engage master gardeners, tree groups, and other volunteers to unite in a search for egg masses and signs of infestation. Uh, as mentioned, spotted lanternfly is now in New York State and can easily and unknowingly hitchhike on vehicles, outdoor equipment, and other materials. So we need eyes on the ground for the species to enhance our chances of finding an infestation while populations are small enough to eradicate. So um, right here on the Slilo Prism website, sliloinvasives.org, if you go to um, the volunteer tab, you'll see um, Invasive Species Volunteer Network, and then this will pop up. This is a story map that we've created uh, that showcases our priority species that we're looking, wanting help looking for. Spotted lanternfly is one of them. Um, this resource here will tell you information about the insect, links for more information. It also will have some photographs. And earlier I mentioned that spotted lanternfly really likes Tree of Heaven. So that's why this resource is here. And this map shows um, confirmed Tree of Heaven observations in IMAP. So this is uh, up to date. If you were to find Tree of Heaven and you know, right now while we're looking at the map and submit it to IMAP, a little dot would pop up. So um, this kind of gives you an idea. There's a bunch of uh, Tree of Heaven down in the Oswego area um, near the lake. And you can kind of get on this map and, and look around and see where Tree of Heaven was located. And the reason why we're mentioning Tree of Heaven is because it does really like this plant. So it might be laying, there might be some eggs laid on this tree, even during the winter, you can see them. In the spring, you, if you visit the Tree of Heaven um, locations, you might see some nymphs um, coming out. Um, and then throughout the summer, you might see some adults. So um, that's why we've showcased where Tree of Heaven is right now. So if anybody is interested in helping us with this effort, please do visit uh, this website. There will be a link um, in the follow-up email and I put it in the feed earlier. Uh, but you can sign up right here and then I get a notification that you're interested and I'll reach out with more information because we're going to start organizing um, a more engaged volunteer network for Spotted Lanternfly. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you is also on our website. If you go to volunteer and then pollinator pathway project. Oh, I already had it open. Oh, well. Um, so this page here will actually showcase all the concepts that we shared in today's talk. Um, and it also has a spot where you can actually take a pledge to choose to grow native species in your, in your gardens um, over exotic or non-native species. And that is helping us quantify uh, who is actually willing to participate in the project, the Pollinator Pathway Project and help us visualize where the gardens or where people might be planting native species um, to support pollinators in this project throughout the Slilo region. So there's a little form here that collects that information if you are willing to grow natives or if you already love to grow natives and you just wanna be, um, just acknowledge that you're doing that, you can just fill out the simple form here and become part of this project. Um, a bunch of you asked a few times in the feed about these um, brochures and documents that we were sharing during the talk. If you click on these, they open right up and you can download them and, and you go through the different pages. So that's all right there for you. Um, and it will also be in the follow-up email. And then there's just a great um, little talk here with uh, Dr. Douglas Palomy um, talking about the power of native plants and insects and the relationships on the website too that you may enjoy as well. And one of the last things I wanted to show you is this community science um, project here, the Empire State Pollinator Survey. Um, it was actually part of um, a New York State Pollinator Protection Plan and it aims to determine the conservation status of a wide array of native insect pollinators in non-agricultural habitats across the state. And you can help in multiple ways, but one of the easiest is by taking photographs of pollinators that you encounter, even if it's from your own backyard, using um, a mobile app called iNaturalist, which I'm going to give you a live demonstration in a moment on how to do that. But I just wanted to let you know that this resource exists and it's linked right on our website and it'll bring you right to their page. 
You can learn anything you want about the project. You can go right to the iNaturalist desktop version right from this page. And there's a bunch of resources here that you can check out during your own time. But I just wanted to let you know that it exists. And I'm going to go shift to going live on, on my phone actually in just a moment here and show you how to use their app. Okay, so you should be seeing my phone now. All right, so you can download um, the app right in the app store. If you just go, I'm using an Android, you just go to Play Store and um, type in iNaturalist app. And then you can just download it right there as simple as that, it's free. And then it has other stuff you might like. But I've already downloaded the app. So I'll just get out of there. And you can do this on a smartphone or tablet. All right, so there's the iMac Naturalist app right here. And this is what it looks like when you open it. So first step is opening top left-hand corner there, you should see the three lines. And then you hit projects. And there's a little uh, magnifying glass on the top and you can just type in empire Oops, if I could type. There it is, survey. And it's running a little slower because I'm streaming. So, um, and then this is the survey. Um, you can hit join. You can go ahead and join that. See how it says join now? And I wanna point out that this about tab on the right hand side is really nice. It has just like in a nutshell what the pollinator survey is. And it also showcases their focal species. Um, I have been collaborating with the organizers of this project and they said that pretty much any like bee or moth or um, butterfly or fly, pretty much anything that like Sue talked about today is fine. Um, and even if you find something really cool that isn't one of those things and you just want to share it, go ahead. Um, they have experts that are sifting through this data, so it's not a big deal. If you um, don't know, you know, the exact species of what you're photographing and you're just like, well, it flies and it's not a flower, I'm going to take a picture of it. That's fine. <laughs> but if you are able to... Um, hang on one second. Oh, okay, well, we're just going to let her exist over there. Okay, so, um, and it also has a link to the, it has a link to the website here from this page as well. Okay, apologies. Um, all right, so if you, um, once you've joined, all you have to do now is make a new observation. So that's on the bottom, you hit take a photo or choose an image. Um, I've downloaded just a picture of a honey, say you have to be quiet of a honeybee, of a honeybee here. And what I wanna show you is what's really neat is this, what did you see option? This, what did you see option here um, will allow you to choose a species that you think is what you saw. And it has, it has intelligence to kind of look at the photograph and then give you what, it, what the technology thinks that you've seen. So this is actually a Western honeybee. So you hit that and it's really cool because what it'll do is it'll give you some examples or it'll give you information about the honeybee that you found. And you can just learn about it if you wanna get a little nerdy. <laughs> um, and then you just move on to the next thing once you've done that. So we've selected that species select and then you go back. Oh, oh okay. All right, and then there's notes here and you can type in something like um, if you knew what flower it was on, for example, or if there was a large population or just something that you want to note, you can note it here. Um, the date, um, you can select the date and this is good. Um, say that you have older photos. So they're collecting information, I believe, from 2018 to 2020. But even if you put information from this year in, they're still using it. They're just analyzing the data from 2018 to 2020. So 
So what's cool about that is if you have a photo from last year or you know older than that of some cool um, insects that you have come across and pollinators, I know that there's some people on this line that are really into taking pictures of bugs. So <laughs> if you have pictures that you wanna share and contribute to this, um, oh, go ahead and feel free and you can change the date um, you know, to the year that you have that picture. It's really important to have the right uh, year. Um, and then the location, um, you can just like type in, I'm in Black River, New York, or just wherever it is that you're at. And the map will pop up and you can move the map around. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can type in an exact address, whatever it is. And then you just hit check mark and hit add to project. And that's why you have to sign up for the project first so that it pops up here, hit add to project. And then it asks you just a little bit of questions about the habitat you found it in. So you just hit the little um, bottom right hand corner. And if it was in your yard, you could just say, you know, um, I think there was one in here for backyard. All right, you just look through here and you can pick whichever one you think is the most accurate description open grass or meadow. And then if you had another choice to describe it, that's all this is, is just, um, you know, if it was maybe a forested area that had a wetland in it or something, you would hit forest and then wetland. Or, you know, if you have a pond in your yard or something, you could hit pond. Um, and you hit check mark. And then that's what uploads it. And then now you see that your observation is there and you're done. And um, you can edit your observation once it's uploaded by simply just hitting it um, and it'll open it back up and you can hit edit and you can make changes or you know, delete it if you want to and then, it, and then it just goes away. So that's the end of my live demonstration. Did anybody have any questions about what I just shared? I didn't see any that came up. Um, there are a few fans of iNaturalist here and um, that was a great demonstration, Megan. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so last thing before we go, I just put um, a link to a, um, a survey, a feedback um, survey um, where you can um, enter some suggestions and what you thought of this webinar so that we can make improvements in the future. So. Thanks for taking a moment to just kind of paste that into your browser before you go. And um, thanks to